Hi, I'm going to discuss the Nintendo 64 system architecture in more detail, as well as talk about some methods for implementing the architecture in an FPGA for hardware emulation. To start off with, I would like to give a brief reminder of the target emulation system from the first video in this series. First, we have an ARM system on chip, or SOC, acting as a setup and management computer. Additionally, this ARM SOC has an on-chip GPU capable of running OpenGL ES. The ARM SOC also has multiple peripherals to enable additional forms of connectivity, such as a SATA port for a hard drive or DVD drive, Ethernet, SD card interface, and USB. The goal would be to have the final graphical output go through the ARM SOC and out via HDMI. Attached to the SOC is a PCIe to PCI bridge, which has a medium end FPGA as well as an expansion slot for additional hardware on the bus. As far as I'm aware, no modern SOCs have a PCI interface, so a PCIe to PCI bridge would be needed. This interface allows for relatively high amounts of data transfer between the connected devices and the ARM SOC. The medium end FPGA is where the majority of the hardware emulation will take place, and it will have a dedicated SD RAM as well as a serial SRAM for BIOS and bootloader storage. The expansion slot could be used for a low-end FPGA, which could emulate a game console cartridge or provide a bridge between the PCI bus and an actual game cartridge. Keep this target system in mind as we cover the N64 architecture. As shown in the previous video, the N64 has a fairly simple architecture. The main processor is the VR4300, which is a pipelined MIPS processor. It connects to the Reality Coprocessor, or RCP, via the 32-bit system bus. This bus also contains eight signals for command and control signals. The RCP is responsible for working out the details of the overall system, connecting to the cartridge via a 16-bit bus, various audio and video peripherals, and managing the main system memory, which used the 9-bit RAM bus protocol. In addition, the RCP acted as an intermediary between the main CPU and the peripheral interface chip, which contained the boot ROM and communicated with the player controllers. The peripheral interface chip, or PIF, was actually a small microcontroller which could also provide some security functionality to ensure that the game media was valid and legal. Some speed values have been added to each component. The main CPU clocked at 93.75 MHz, while the RCP clocked at 62.5 MHz. Here the CPU is functioning off of the RCP clock source, however it is using a 1 to 1.5 clock multiplier to achieve the 93.75 MHz. Additionally, the system bus interface for the VR4300 operates at the same frequency as the master clock, being 62.5 MHz. The RAM connected to the RCP operates at 250 MHz, however since it is a double data rate protocol, this is effectively 500 MHz, meaning that the data is sent on both the rising and falling edges. The cartridge interface is apparently capable of 140 MHz data communication, which may be interfacing with the RCP via a 32 or 64 bit register, allowing for the RCP to deal with it at its internal 62.5 MHz. The video DAC runs at the NTSC or PAL standard, operating at 29.97 frames per second and 25 frames per second, respectively. The audio DAC uses 44 or 48 kHz samples which is nowhere near a problem for an FPGA operating in the hundreds of megahertz. And finally, the PIF has an undocumented speed, however I suspect it is somewhere in the low megahertz, since it only needs to communicate small amounts of data with the controllers at perhaps millisecond intervals. The PIF does not need to be fast. As mentioned before, the peripheral interface was responsible for communicating with the controllers, storing the boot ROM, and performing security operations with the game cartridges. Luckily, the N64 patent contained a block diagram of the PIF so that we could look at it in more detail. First of all, let's identify the I.O. signals. In the upper left, we have the security signals for the cartridge. In the lower left, we have the reality coprocessor signals, which in turn give the CPU access to the boot ROM. In the upper right, we have the CPU signals, which are both interrupts. Most likely, these are to tell the CPU that there's new data from the controllers or to stop the CPU from executing an invalid game cartridge and in the lower right we have the controller signals. We can also break the PIF into a few main blocks. There is the aforementioned microcontroller, the game controller interface, the 64 bytes of RAM for the controller data, and the boot ROM. There is also an interface block to process requests from the RCP. Since the goal is to emulate this in an FPGA, however, we can simplify the diagram quite a bit. We can begin by looking at the basic structure of the system, 
we have an FPGA and an ARM CPU connected via PCI. Since multiple components need to connect to the PCI bus, we need a PCI arbiter. Now the goal would be to have either the game media somehow accessible by the ARM CPU or have an actual cartridge connected to the PCI bus. In either case, we may need the security MCU, which can be a very small 8-bit soft core microcontroller. For generality, let's focus on the USB controllers connected to the ARM CPU, which will need to have the relevant controller data stored in temporary RAM. And we also need the boot ROM, which can and should be stored in the off-chip BIOS SRAM. This will allow the emulation system to be quickly reset without reloading the boot ROM over the PCI connection. To first populate the SRAM, however, we need to add a connection between the PCI Arbiter and the boot ROM interface. And finally, the boot ROM and controller RAM need to be accessible from the RCP, so we can simply connect them both directly to the RCP's internal bus. In principle, we would probably consolidate both the controller RAM and the boot ROM into a single RCP bus port, since their memory map is contiguous. While the block diagram may look complicated, it is much simpler than the original PIFS block diagram, most of which can be implemented in a few lines of HDL code. The VR4300 will be covered in much more detail in a following video. However, the basic architecture is a 64-bit pipelined MIPS CPU, where the CPU has five stages. The VR4300 has a MIPS system control coprocessor, or CP0, which does exception and interrupt handling, system configuration, and has a 32-entry TLB for virtual address translation. In addition to supporting virtual addresses, the VR4300 also supports process IDs for different processes or threads, as well as several permissions including kernel, supervisor, and user. As far as I'm aware though, the majority of N64 applications ran entirely in kernel mode, did not use a process ID, and used a flat virtual memory map, meaning that address translated directly to main memory without any strange mappings. The VR4300 also included the System Coprocessor 1, or CP1, which provided the ability to do 32-bit and 64-bit floating point operations. This is something the original PlayStation was unable to do. In actuality, most of CP1 was integrated directly into the main CPU. However, architecturally, code runs as if it was a separate entity. Note that the N64 was almost exclusively used in 32-bit mode. However, unlike many believe, using 64-bit instructions did not increase code size, they simply provide functionality that was not needed by most games. And finally, the VR4300 does have L1 cache, which is divided into instruction cache and data cache, being 16 kilobytes and 8 kilobytes respectively. As you can probably tell, implementing just the VR4300 is a feat in itself. The Reality Coprocessor, or RCP, was responsible for interfacing between the CPU and everything else on the N64. In a sense, it was a combined GPU, APU, Northbridge, and Southbridge. Internally, all the subcomponents of the RCP were connected via a 64-bit bus, which most likely operated at the RCP's master clock speed of 62.5 MHz. Connected to the bus were interfaces for every peripheral, as well as an interface with the CPU itself. These included the Parallel Interface, or PI, for the cartridge, the Serial Interface, or SI, for the PIF, the Video Interface, or VI, for the video DAC, the Audio Interface, or AI, for the audio DAC, and the MIPS Interface, or MI, for the CPU. The MIPS Interface was needed to set interrupt masks and to clear interrupts, as well as Arbiter CPU access to the internal bus. The reason for the Arbiter was that the system RAM was connected to the internal bus and not directly to the CPU. This required a memory controller, especially since the main RAM used the RAM bus protocol, which was not as simple as modern-day SD RAM. Not that modern-day SD RAM is simple. Finally, we have the Reality Signal Processor, or RSP, and the Reality Display Processor, or RDP. A few things to note here. The CPU was only able to interact with the RCP components by reading and writing to specific registers. The one exception here being the RAM, where the CPU had full read-write ability, which was abstracted away by the CPU's interface. Since the CPU could not interact with the components directly, the majority of them had their own DMA controllers, which allowed the CPU to specify a start address and a size for a memory transfer. For example, to play a sound stream by sending it to the audio DAC, the CPU wrote a start address of the stream and the length of the stream to transfer. There was then a DMA control register, which if anything other than zero was written to it, the DMA transfer would start. This would copy the audio stream from the RAM and send it out to the audio DAC. 
This also means the CPU can effectively play a large sound file by simply performing three writes to relevant registers and can then continue working on another task while the DMA controller copies the data from memory. It should be noted that this is how most modern computers interface with subcomponents. Since the majority of the components listed so far are simply DMAs with a simple state machine, we can ignore them for now and focus on the RSP and the RDP. In terms of implementation of the bus, this could either be an already existing bus standard such as Avalon or Wishbone, or it could be a custom implementation. A custom implementation may be warranted, however, allowing for a custom arbiter that takes individual component priorities into account. For example, a DMA request from the video interface is more important than one from the audio interface. At the heart of the Reality Signal processor is a 32-bit pipeline processor known as the Scalar Unit, or SU. This processor implements a five-stage pipeline and the majority of the instructions in the MIPS-3 instruction set. This processor does not, however, implement floating point operations, nor does it implement multiplication, division, or exception handling. The reason for this is that it is mainly responsible for controlling and issuing instructions to the vector unit, or VU. The vector unit is implemented as the MIPS coprocessor number 2 and consists of eight single instruction multiple data units, each with a 16-bit execution path. These eight SIMD units are connected to a set of 32 registers of 128 bits in length. In addition to performing multiplication and addition operations on eight 16-bit values, they can also be configured to perform operations on four 32-bit values, which is needed to compute 3D transformations. Aside from the eight SIMD units, there is also a single 16-bit reciprocal or inversion unit, which is capable of performing division and square roots on a 16-bit value. Since the VU core is implemented as coprocessor 2 to the scalar core, it is tightly coupled, allowing for register transfers between the two units, as well as dual issue instructions. This means that in a single cycle, a SU and a VU instruction can be simultaneously issued, as long as neither instruction causes a data hazard with the other. The computational core of the RSP is connected to an internal instruction memory and data memory, each being 4 kilobytes in size. These memories are located within the Reality coprocessor next to the RSP and are therefore fast to access. To prevent collisions with the main CPU, the RSP is actually restricted to this 8 kilobyte address space, being unable to access main memory at all. Instead, data and instructions must be loaded into the RSP via a DMA controller. The DMA controller is set up by either the RSP or the CPU and will copy data from main memory to IMEM or DMEM asynchronously to the CPU and the RSP execution. It should be noted that the RSP can be programmed to wait for a DMA controller to finish before it continues execution. Connected to the SU processor is a system control coprocessor, CP0, which implements some of the standard MIPS CP0 functionality, but mainly serves as a way to configure the RSP as well as the RDP. The CP0 is connected directly to the RCP bus, providing the same interface to the SU and the CPU. Additionally, CP0 contains the DMA controller registers and is where DMA operations are set up. And finally, the RDP is connected to the DMEM, which allows for the RSP to set up display commands for the RDP in DMEM and copy them directly to the RDP instead of first copying them to RAM and then copying them to the RDP. Furthermore, besides commands, the DMEM could store processed texture data, which would then be accessed directly by the RDP instead of requiring two copy operations to and from main memory. In terms of implementation, all of the RSP should be easily implemented in an FPGA, with the memories implemented as block RAMs. While the RAMs and the actual RSP were single ported, an FPGA implementation could be potentially dual ported, with the DMA controller having an exclusive port. Other than that, more details will probably be discussed in future videos, as well as more details on how the RSP actually works. Next, we have the Reality Display Processor. This is probably one of the most complicated components of the N64. As previously mentioned, the RDP shares control registers with the coprocessor 0 in the RSP and are accessible by the CPU via the RCP bus. The control registers contain fields to control the DMA controller, which will then transfer display commands from either the RSP D memory or main memory via the RCP bus. These commands are then stored in a 64-bit wide command FIFO, which will be read and interpreted by some RDP master logic machine. 
The documentation on the length of the command FIFO is lacking, however it is most likely 22 lines of 64-bit double words, since this is the length of the longest command. The commands include everything from setting states in the RDP, to loading textures, to drawing triangles or rectangles. Note that the drawing of triangles and rectangles are done in 2D space, meaning that their coordinates are already projected into screen space by the RSP. Speaking of textures, the RDP has a 4 kilobyte texture memory, which is connected to a DMA controller. It is unclear whether or not this is the same DMA controller used by the command FIFO, or if it is a second one. As stated before, textures are loaded with commands, which specify the start address, the texture size, color format, stride, etc. These are stored within four 1 kilobyte banks, allowing the RDP to simultaneously stream data from four TMEM addresses at once. Additionally, the TMEM has the ability to store tiles and color lookup tables, similar to how older consoles such as the NES worked. While the TMEM can effectively store as many tiles and textures as the memory can fit, it only provides the functionality to access up to eight tiles at once through tile descriptors. It is unclear as to where the tile descriptors are stored, however they are most likely implemented in hardware registers instead of in TMEM. The display pipeline is implemented in several stages, the first being the rasterizer, which generates the screen coordinates for the given shape. Most likely this component includes edge detection and clipping hardware so that pixels outside of the shape are not generated. The rasterizer also computes the texture coordinates for textured shapes and sends them to the texture pipeline. Here, four texture units retrieve color values from nearby pixels of the currently rendering texture and send them to a texture filter which performs bilinear filtering. The filter texture color and color from the rasterizer are then sent to the color combined unit, which is responsible for blending the colors together. This is also where the shading is done. Finally, the color combiner sends the output color and the rasterizer simultaneously sends the screen coordinates and the Z buffer value to the blending unit. Here, the blender is connected to the frame buffer interface, which can read and write to the frame buffer stored in main memory. For every pixel position on the screen that is rendered, the blender will take the depth value Z, the depth buffer value from the frame buffer, the pixel color from the frame buffer, and the color value from the color combiner to determine if the current color value should be discarded or should be used to overwrite this pixel in the frame buffer. The blender supports normal depth buffering as well as transparency blending and also contains the anti-aliasing functions for the N64. Supposedly, the N64 was capable of processing up to two 32-bit pixels per cycle or four 16-bit pixels per cycle in single color film mode. This might be possible if the render pipeline was pipelined in the same way that the CPU and the RSP are pipelined, meaning that there are several pixels simultaneously in different stages of the pipeline. It should also be noted that in the textured mode, the throughput is either one pixel per cycle or one pixel every two cycles in order to do MIP mapping and fog. Implementing this could prove challenging, but should be possible. There are two main ways the RDP could be implemented in hardware. The first option is the most obvious, full logic implementation, where the entire thing is implemented in the FPGA. To do this, however, since the ARM coprocessor would be used to output the final HDMI video, some additional functionality would be needed. This would be a frame buffer DMA controller, which connects to the PCI arbiter. This would be continually copying the frame buffer from the main memory and sending it over the PCI bus for the ARM SOC to then output over HDMI. Alternatively, most ARM system-on-chip processors include a camera interface which could probably be used to copy frame data over and parallel without holding up the PCI bus. Another possible method would be to have the FPGA directly output to HDMI, where it would act as an HDMI sync taking in the output from the ARM SOC and then compositing the result directly on top of the frame buffer. This would allow for a higher HDMI throughput and would not tie up the PCI bus. However, this would end up taking up more logic in the FPGA to implement the composition engine and the HDMI controllers. The alternative method is to do a shared implementation between the FPGA and the ARM SOC. Here, the FPGA handles the copying and partial decoding of the display commands. However, it does not attempt to do any rendering. Instead, it sends the display commands to the PCI arbiter and has the GPU on the ARM SOC perform the display operations. In addition to transiting the commands, a texture DMA controller would then be needed to copy texture data over the PCI bus to the ARM system memory. Both approaches have their advantages and disadvantages, which will probably be talked about in a future video.
For now, however, it should be noted that either implementation would have the ability to upscale the N64 image data at draw time, providing higher resolution and crisper image quality than the original hardware. On that note, I would like to mention a few methods for implementing upscaling. If we send the RTP commands over the PCI bus to the ARM SOC, then upscaling can be done in software via OpenGL. If on the other hand, we do the rendering in hardware, then the process is not quite as straightforward. To start off with, the N64 has limited capability in terms of video output resolutions, where it only supported four. The standard frame buffer size for the N64 was 240p, and as a result, outputting at the other resolutions required hardware upscaling. Note that all of these resolutions are 4 to 3 aspect ratios, and the 480i and 576i correspond to the limit of NTSC and PAL videos, respectively. We can compare this to the target goal of 1080p in either standard definition 4 to 3 aspect ratio or high definition with a 16 to 9 aspect ratio. For now, let's assume we are using a 240p frame buffer and we want to upscale to the 1080p standard definition, which is 4 to 3 aspect ratio. This would mean multiplication by a factor of 4.5 in both directions. There are two ways we can do this. We can do a post-render upscale where the color values are stretched or interpolated between pixels. This is what the N64 originally did for higher resolutions and is what typical upscale hardware does. We could alternatively upscale the architecture. This is where we physically draw more pixels. The easiest way to do this is to simply tack on extra bits to the pixel coordinate. However, that would require the scale factor to be a power of 2. Additionally, drawing more pixels means putting more strain on the hardware, which at the RDP's original clock speed was most likely pushing the limits of the RDP. With that said, there are two ways we can implement an architectural upscale. We can simply overclock the RDP using a faster clock. This is possible due to the fact that we are implementing it in an FPGA, which can clock much faster than the original hardware. This would be a linear scaling since there is only one drawing pipeline. Unfortunately, this may not be possible since the actual drawing hardware is somewhat complicated. Alternatively, we could simply implement additional pipelines in parallel, which is the highest chance to succeed. An actual solution would probably mean a combination of post-render interpolation and an architectural pipeline increase. Notice how we have a 4.5 scale increase, which is not a power of 2. We would either need to do a centered 4 times increase and draw the surrounding pixels in black, do the 4 times increase and do a post-render upscale to 4.5 times, or do an 8 times increase and do a downscale. Obviously, the 8 times increase would be the best solution, allowing for much better hardware anti-aliasing as well. However, the number of pixels increase quadratically while the scale increases linearly. This means that a 4 times scale increase would require 16 pipelines in total, and an 8 times increase would require 64 in total. Obviously, the 8 times increase is not practical, so we are stuck with the 4 times increase solution. Still, this would provide a higher resolution image than the original hardware. In both cases, a larger frame buffer would be needed. However, this is not a problem with modern day DRAMs that are orders of magnitude larger than the original N64's memory capacity. So in short, to upscale to 1080p standard definition, we would need to extend a single pixel coordinate by two bits in each axis, resulting in one pixel becoming 16 subpixels, where each of the 16 subpixels is then issued to one of the 16 drawing pipelines. The end result would then be sent to either a hardware upscaler or be padded by black pixels, all of which would be done without the software running on the system knowing the difference. As a brief aside, increasing the drawing resolution at this stage in the render pipeline will result in better looking edges, since the edge detection algorithm of triangles will be done on the 16 subpixels and not the original pixel. Next we have the game media for the N64 which was held on cartridges, which used a 16-bit cartridge bus. This bus was connected to the parallel interface in the RCP. Most cartridges contain two ROMs split over two domains, each having two different address spaces. In addition to the ROMs, most cartridges contained a battery-backed SRAM which stored game settings and save game data. Additionally, most cartridges had small EE PROMs which were attached to one of the ROMs. These may have been used to store specific configuration information and did not need to be battery-backed. And finally, to prevent users from using pirated games, each cartridge contained a CIC chip which was connected directly to the PIF and could respond to or assert interrupts to prevent the CPU from executing. 
A few notes for the game media. Since the cartridge bus was 16 bits, it was half word addressable. The entire cartridge bus was mapped to a 32-bit address space. This was done with a signal for the upper address and a signal for the lower address. The upper 16 bits would be placed on the bus with the address upper signal raised. Then the lower 16 bits would be placed on the bus with the lower address signal raised. If neither of the two address signals were raised, the value on the bus would be a 16-bit half word of data. The bus supported read-write functionality, which allowed for writing save game data to the SRAM. The SRAM and ROMs auto-incremented the address pointer every time the read signal was asserted, which allowed for large blocks of data to be transferred without continually sending the desired address. And of course, the RCP's parallel interface contains a DMA controller, which can be used to copy blocks of cartridge data into the system memory. Implementing this would be fairly straightforward. There are two ways of doing this. The first one is to have the ARM CPU handle the save game media. This would store the ROM data as well as any save game data on either an SD card or an attached hard drive. The second option is to have another PCI device on the bus, which interfaces directly with a physical game cartridge. In this case, all that would be needed is a simple interface to bridge the cartridge protocol and the PCI protocol. In both cases, either the ARM SOC or the PCI device would respond to specific game media requests over the PCI bus, and this would be done through the PCI arbiter in the FPGA. And finally, we have the N64 memory map, which shows where each component is mapped to in the 32-bit address space. Recall that to the main CPU, there's no difference between the RDRAM part of memory and the RSP registers, since they are both accessed the same way through the system bus. The only parts that were not previously talked about were the AI and VI registers, which set up audio sampling and video modes, as well as a DMA controller for each, the RAM and RI registers, which were used to control the RD RAM, and the system AD space, which was used by the optional disk drive and the development kit. Note that the system AD space was mapped to the parallel interface, which was due to the fact that the connection to the disk drive and development kit was done through the cartridge bus. Additionally, note that the RD RAM space was 63 megabytes, where the maximum memory for the system was 8 megabytes. It would be trivial to implement the full RD RAM space within an FPGA, potentially opening the way to develop games for the emulated platform that make use of a larger memory space. And on that note, notice the cartridge D1A3 space is over 1 gigabyte in size, which means that substantially larger games could theoretically be developed for the system. In the next video, I will cover the VR4300 CPU in more detail. Thanks for watching.